Well, good morning. It's welcome to see everybody here. Do we have any first time visitors today? Well, welcome. And you sat up front. Are you Lutheran? <laughs> where, where are you coming from? <laughs> oh, well, great. I'm glad you did. Welcome. Welcome. It's good to have you. And uh, for everyone else that's here, it's good to see you again. And we have our technicians hiding in the back room, so we're being recorded. So that is always nice that we can welcome those who are watching us at home. I'm excited about that. I have some books up here. Council. Council, this is your new book for our council meeting. I need you to read the first seven pages. And remember, we're not meeting this Tuesday. It's the following Tuesday. So I'm giving you plenty of time to read this book. And, and if anybody has a chance, St. George and the Dragon and the, the, uh, the Quest for the Holy Grail, it is a fantastic, funny, insightful book. And it would really do well, in, and I think it helps us to learn to read the Bible with new eyes. Because so often we like to think that the Bible is a bunch of facts and history and science, and, and, it's, and it's none of that. But there is so much truth in the Bible. And I think this book is so humorous and insightful that it, it invites us to see the truth. In our, in our quest for the Holy Grail. And so I invite you, if you can get it on Kindle, I've got these for our council people. So I'm gonna put this down here as you come up for communion, grab one and commend that to you. Are there other announcements we need to make for the good of the family? Jim, are you gonna come out and make an announcement? There he is, see, there is somebody back there behind the curtain. Thank you for all your hard work. That is not an easy task. It would be so easy just to go ahead and take the first person because, you know, hey, we've been without a pastor for a long time and we want to get on the road and so just grab somebody and it may not be a good fit. So we trust our committee is doing their due diligence and is looking out for the, the whole of the congregation. So we'll trust that the Holy Spirit is involved in this. So with that, uh, I don't have any other announcements. Oh, Pastor John? Okay. Good one. If you haven't missed, if his has some fantastic studies. Also, I want to remind people we have fellowship after our worship today over in the fellowship hall. So. <sighs> Next week? Okay, you promise. Next week will be fellowship over the fellowship hall. <laughs> so he says, come to the Bible study. They do some great fellowship in the Bible study. It is a good, high, ho holy, hilarious time uh, with those Bible studies. So with that, I am going to invite you, because so often we can get so caught up in our religion that we forget to, and we leave the Holy Spirit, we leave God out of it. That we think that if we're not following the right format, the right ritual, that somehow we're not going to connect with God. And I can tell you, it doesn't matter where you are, what you're doing, what the bulletin says or doesn't say. You invite the Holy Spirit into your life and seek and see God again for the first time. 
Don't try to capture something that happened to Christmas Eve or something that happened when you were a child in your home church. It's impossible to recapture those moments. You are a new person. This is a new time and a new day. So open yourself to worship in a new way this day. Expect God to show up here today. And I invite you to please stand as you are able and let us prepare ourselves to worship with our confession. You may kneel or stand however you are able. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose steadfast love endures forever. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done, things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your spirit so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now let us sing together, Here I Am, Lord, hymn number 574, 574.
Amen. So again, it's so good to see you worshiping here. Let's find out who is worshiping with us this day. I invite you to look around and say good morning to those around you. And if you don't know the person, ask their name. Let us pray. O oh Lord God, your mercy delights us, and the world longs for your loving care. Hear the cries of everyone in need, and turn our hearts to love our neighbors with the love of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. I invite you to go ahead and be seated at this time, and let us sing together. My life flows on endless song. We're going to sing verses 1, 3, and 4. 1, 3, and 4. was that I'm happy to oh Joyce no okay I'll do it <laughs> first reading is from Isaiah is not this the fast that I choose to loose the bonds of injustice to undo the thongs of the yoke to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover them and not to hide yourself from your own kin? Then your light shall break forth like the dawn and your healing shall spring up quickly. Your vindicator shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry for help and he will say, here I am. If you remove the yoke from among you, the pointing of the finger, the speaking of evil, if you offer your food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then your light shall rise in the darkness and your gloom be like the noonday. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and with your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. The gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. Just do it. It's the now famous slogan for Nike, the world's leading manufacturer of athletic shoes and apparel, and a major manufacturer of sports equipment. That swoosh has been Nike's logo since 1971 when it was designed by a student at Portland State University. The slogan, just do it, was coined for a 1988 Nike campaign. It was chosen as one of the top five slogans for the 20th century, and it is so wildly popular that it has become enshrined in the Smithsonian Institute. Now here's a creepy little piece of trivia. The slogan, just do it, was inspired by the last word spoken by a convicted murderer, Gary Gilmore. When he was seated before a firing squad in Utah in 1977, he was asked if he had any last words. And Gilmore simply said, let's do it. Despite its eerie origin, just do it. It's a great marketing slogan, especially for a company that sells athletic shoes. It's simple, it's clear, and it's motivating. In just three words, it says a mouthful. It says, come on, quit being lazy. Get up and get going. No excuses. Quit procrastinating. Suck it up. You can do it. You've got it in you. Get moving. It's motivating. It's inspiring. And it's a great slogan for those couch potatoes and weekend warriors alike. Just do it. It is, however, a dangerous slogan to apply to our scripture reading today. And I'm afraid that far too often, that is exactly the message that we preachers have conveyed when talking about this text. And it's easy to see why. See, Jesus ends this compelling story with the words, go and do likewise. That sounds a lot like, 
just do it, doesn't it? But I'd like to suggest that there's much more going on in this story than meets the eye. So let's break it open and see what else God might be wanting to say to us. It all begins with a lawyer, someone who is an expert in God's law. He has a question for Jesus. You know, he wants to know what he has to do to inherit eternal life. And it's a reasonable question. As an expert in the Hebrew scriptures, this lawyer, he believes that God's promises and eternal inheritance, a resurrection of the righteous. The lawyer wants to know if his ideas about how to earn that inheritance matches up with Rabbi Jesus' ideas. And Jesus, in typical rabbinic fashion, he answers the lawyer's question with another question. He asks the lawyer how he reads the scriptures. And the lawyer answers beautifully, love God, love neighbor. Jesus himself has said that the entirety of God's law can be summarized in those two commands. Love God, love your neighbor. And so Jesus says to the lawyer, bingo, good answer. That's what the law says. So just do it. Well, I suspect that this lawyer was no fool, and as is true of many lawyers, he is a precise man. He wants to know the exact terms of the contract. He wants to know the boundaries. And so he asks, who exactly qualifies as my neighbor? Who is in and who is out? Who is worthy and who is unworthy? Who do I have to love and who can I ignore? And in answer to the lawyer's question, Jesus tells this remarkable little story about a man who was robbed and beaten and left for dead. A priest and a temple worker, they see the bloodied man, but they avoid him. They walk by on the other side of the road. But a Samaritan, a race of people despised by the Jews, comes along and sees this bloodied man. He is deeply moved, and he goes to extraordinary measures to care for him. And then Jesus turns the lawyer's question upside down. The lawyer asked, who is my neighbor? Jesus asks, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers. The lawyer responds, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus says, go and do likewise. That's as far as Luke's gospel takes the story. And it would, again, it would be easy to assume that that is the point that we should all go out and just do a better job of loving others. But let's play this story out together. The lawyer asked what he has to do to inherit eternal life, and the answer he receives is to love God and love neighbor. In addition, the lawyer learns that loving his neighbor means seeing himself as a neighbor to all humanity, to anyone who has a need. That's simple enough. So we can imagine the lawyer walking away from this conversation with Jesus, and perhaps he's headed on to the temple. You know, he doesn't get 10 steps before he encounters a blind man begging. He's seen, he has seen this blind beggar before. He's always suspected that somewhere along the line that this man sinned and therefore his blindness is God's punishment. 
Not only that, but this blind man's hygiene, it's less than stellar, which is one more reason that the lawyer has always avoided him and walked on the other side of the road. But in that moment, Jesus' words come back to him. Love your neighbor. Well, surely Jesus didn't mean this guy. The lawyer, he, he enters the temple for prayer. He reads a little scripture. He stands to pray. But his heart really isn't in it. You know, his, his mind is, is caught up in the fight that he had with his wife earlier that morning. And then it drifts to that shawl that he saw in the market the other day, the one with the beautiful colors and the many tassels, the one that he wants but doesn't quite have enough money to buy. How will he get the money to buy it? He is vaguely aware that he's supposed to be thanking and praising God in this time of prayer. And Jesus' words come back to him. Love God. Well, the lawyer heads home feeling guilty about how distracted he was in prayer and mildly annoyed by how crowded the streets are and how few people have enough respect for his position to move out of his way. As soon as he walks into his home, he hears a shattering of a pot. His two-year-old son has accidentally knocked it from the table, and now it lays in pieces on the floor. The lawyer quickly moves to his son and yanks his arm hard and throws him over his knees and takes out his frustrations of this day on his son's backside. When his arm tires, he releases the child who runs to his mother, and while the lawyer, annoyed at his wife's scowl, goes outside to sit under the palm tree. How hard life is, he thinks to himself. How wonderful it will be when this hardship is over and he can dwell in God's perfect presence in eternal life. And that's when Jesus' words come back to him yet again. Love God. Love neighbor. Do these things and you will live. In that moment, the lawyer realizes just how dead he is and how dead he will always be in this life and in the next if, if he must love God and love neighbor in order to inherit eternal life. The lawyer gets up, runs back to the city searching for Jesus, and when he finally finds Jesus, he falls breathless at his feet Lord, he cries, I cannot do it. I cannot love God as I ought. I cannot love my neighbor. I can't even love my own family. How can I possibly inherit eternal life? You can't, Jesus says with a smile, laying a caring hand on the lawyer's shoulder. You never could. Eternal life isn't a thing to be earned. It isn't about what you must do. It is a gift I give you because I love you. Loving God and loving neighbor because you have to isn't really love at all. So go. Know that you are loved. Love God and love neighbor because you get to, not because you have to. And know that my spirit will always be with you. Friends, my brothers and sisters in Christ, if just do it, were Jesus' final answer to the Lord, to that lawyer and to us, then this story would not be good news at all. It would just be one more law to live by, one more reason to, to live in failure, guilt, and shame. And if we're honest, we'll admit 
that we struggle to love people that we know and like, let alone those who we don't know and don't like. So if just do it was the point of this story, if just do it isn't the point of this story, then what is? What might God be saying to us? Well, let me suggest two things. First, I think the story of the Good Samaritan is meant to remind us that fullness of life does not begin with what we do, but what has been done for us by the grace in Jesus. I think this story is meant to drive us to our knees with gratitude because we are set free by God's remarkable, unconditional, unending love for us. We don't love God or love our neighbor because we have to, because that wouldn't be real love at all. That kind of love wouldn't breathe life into us or into others. It would only leave us dead choked with guilt and shame. Instead, the good news of God's love for us in Jesus, it sets us free to really love. Now, I don't know about you, but I need to be reminded of that <laughs> over and over again. You know, my, my life is kind of like a car out of an alignment, constantly veers towards that ditch of just do it, righteousness. And like that lawyer, subtly or not so subtly, get, I get caught up in believing that I have to earn God's love, so I wind up trying hard and failing miserably. And then I wind up feeling guilty, telling myself that I'm worthless and hopeless, which makes me feel less likely and able to love anyone well making me feel even more worthless and hopeless. It's a vicious cycle that I have ridden on more often than I care to admit. But the good news of this story, it knocks me off of that cycle and into the arms of God's mercy and grace reminding me again that I am loved not because of what I have done, but because of what God has done for us in Jesus. God's love sets us free to love. And that, I think, is the first point of this story. And here's the second. We need help loving God and loving others. And even though the primary point of this story is not just to do it, there is a definite call upon our lives as Christ's followers to love God and to love our neighbor. So as a people so dearly loved by God, we are moved to love God, love our neighbor. But as soon as we try, we realize how challenged we are. As I often thought about this passage, I've come to realize that I need at least two things to help me to really love my neighbor more. And it's two things that only God can provide. First, I, knew, I need new eyes, new vision. I need eyes of faith that will allow me to see all people in need as my neighbor and not as a nuisance or a distraction. It's far too easy to see people without really seeing them, or at least not seeing them as any of my concern. But Jesus is calling us all to see in a new way. I need new eyes. And maybe you do too. Second, I need a new heart. A heart that beats for the things that really matter to God. When we hear the story of the Good Samaritan, we are often pretty hard on that priest and the temple worker. But truth be told, 
they are caught between a rock and a hard place. Or to be more specific, they are caught between two competing laws. On one hand, God's law forbade them to touch blood or a dead body. On the other hand, they are commanded to aid someone who is in need. So how can they be obedient to both aspects of the law? Such situations were common, and rabbis, they debated frequently about greater and lesser laws so that they could know which law trumped another in these circumstances. Well, in this case, the priest and the temple worker, they chose poorly. Because when it comes to living God's agenda, love trumps everything. I need a heart that beats with that kind of love. And maybe you do too. When it comes to eternal life, our calling is not to just do it, but dare to believe that God has already done it all in Jesus Christ. We have been set free to love God and love our neighbor. And that is very good news indeed. Amen.
Amen. May it be so. I invite you to stand as you are able and let us confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creeds, those words in which we were baptized. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. United in Christ and guided by the Spirit, we pray for the church, the creation, and all in need. Good and gracious God, you have placed your word of love in the heart of your church. Fill your church with compassion that we bear the fruit of your healing mercy to a broken world. God of grace, hear our prayer. You created the earth with seeds sprouting up new life. We pray for the flourishing of fruit trees and orchards, vines and bushes. Prosper the work of those who plant, tend, harvest, and gather. God of grace, hear our prayer. Show us your ways and teach us your paths of justice and love. Raise up community and national leaders to challenge and dismantle societal structures that perpetuate ethnic, racial, and religious profiling and discrimination. God of grace, come near to all in need. Orchestrate kindness in the face of cruelty. Hope where there is despair. Love in the face of neglect. Comfort where there is death, and healing in illness. We pray especially for those in our midst, for Catherine and Jeannie and Stephen, Peggy, Joel, Pat, Heidi, Luke, Evan, Eleanor, Suzanne, and for those whom we now name aloud, And in the silence of our hearts, you are the great physician. And we ask for your loving care surround our loved ones. God of grace, turn this community towards neighbors in need. Bring aid and support to those who are poor, beaten down, abused, forgotten, silenced, or avoided. God of grace. We give thanks for the saints who revealed your love and mercy in this life. Inspired by their witness, strengthen us to live in hope. God of grace, God of every time and place, in Jesus' name and filled with your Holy Spirit, we entrust these spoken prayers and those in our hearts into your holy keeping. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us share that sign of peace with one another. Pastor John, you came back just in time. Please be seated. Pastor John is going to share his story of, thank you, of how he came to give and why he bothers to give. <laughs> why do you bother? <laughs> well, for one thing, it affirms my need for an identity. I don't need that.
Thank you, Pastor John. <laughs> it's always fascinating to hear different people's story of how they've come to, to have that understanding. I invite you to stand as you're able and let's give thanks and praise for the offerings that we have received this day. And we ask God that you bless it to, to the good of this congregation, to the ministry inside the walls and outside in our community. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You forgot to put your, well, come on. <laughs> there we go. And now, God of abundance, you have set before us a plentiful harvest. As we feast on your goodness, strengthen us to labor in your field and equip us to bear fruit for the good of all. In the name of Jesus, amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks. He broke it and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And then again after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks. Gave it to all, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And now let us be so bold to pray in those words our Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. In Christ's presence, there is fullness of joy as we come to the banquet. And as we come, we always remember that it is Christ's table and it is at Christ's invitation that all are welcome. No exceptions. I invite you to be seated, and I also want to point out that the song that we'll be singing during uh, communion is that hymn, 483, 483. Start right here. Thanks, Jack. And then you're going to come over here. Nope, stay right there, right there. And your wife's going to join you. 
And your grandson's going to join you? Your daughter? Your son-in-law? There you go. And you're welcome to kneel as you are able. This is the body of Christ given for you. The body of Christ given for you. The body of Christ given for you. It's the body of Christ given for you. The body of Christ. Christ is with us. The body of Christ. He is with us. The body of Christ. The body of Christ. The body of Christ. The body of Christ. The body
the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace this day and always. Amen. Let us pray. Life-giving God, through this meal you have bandaged our wounds and fed us with your mercy. Now send us forth to live for others, both friend and stranger, that all may come to know your love. This we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. I invite those who share our communion with our homebound to come forward at this time for prayer of blessing. I think Claire's on vacation. Suzanne's broke her ankle. We need to take the homebound uh, communion to her. <laughs> Let us pray. Compassionate God, as Jesus called the disciples to follow him, bless those who go forth to share your word and sacrament with those who are sick and homebound. May these gifts be signs of our love and prayers that through the sharing of the body and blood of Christ, all may know your grace and healing revealed in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now the God of peace, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you, comfort you, and show you the path of life this day and always. Amen. Our sending song today will be, um, we are marching, we are marching in the light of God, hymn number 866, 866. There wasn't enough room on that board for all of our hymns today. So you have to trust me, I'm giving you the right page number. <laughs> 